if you only got to learn about two things in your whole journey, what they should be is fear and desire. Once you've learned about fear and desire, there is nothing else to learn. Fear and desire, you'll come to see, are what bind you into your personal self. Fear and desire, you will come to see, are what create your personal self. Fear and desire, you will come to see, are what determine where you go, what you say, who you're with, what's happened to you, and what will happen to you. The only thing on the other side of the root of fear and desire is the self. That's the crossing point, fear and desire. You have no right to talk about desire without talking about fear. You have no right to talk about fear without talking about desire. They are like the positive and negative ends of the magnet. You can't say which came first. You can't say whether the positive end or the negative end came first. A magnet, by its nature, emanates on one end positive and the other negative, and it is the interaction of that force field that gives it its power, and everything goes out from there. That's how fear and desire are. Let's look at them. What is desire? What is fear? Desire is very, very easy. Desire is your natural, instinctual, innate, intuitive attempt to compensate for what's missing. If you are not whole, if you do not feel complete, if there's not just a state of total content well-being in your heart, your mind, and your soul, there is the soul's tendency to want to make it whole, to want to be complete, to not have to deal with the sense of lacking. That attempt to fill what's missing is the power, the force, the vector of desire. It's not a bad thing, not a wrong thing, no more than you don't drink properly, you get thirsty. You don't eat properly, you get hungry. If your soul is not whole, if your being is not complete, there is a deep, deep, deep force that wishes to bring about the completeness. That attempt to compensate for what's lacking naturally within causes the reaching, the drives, the impulses, the urges outside. You attempt to find in order to fulfill, to complete what's missing. That's what desire is, period. It is a force field. A vacuum has certain qualities but it also has an effect on the environment around it. Would you define a vacuum as the emptiness, the lacking of pressure, of gases, of whatever, matter, molecules of certain substance? And then if that vacuum is not separated from its environment, it will instantaneously attempt to do what? What will happen because there's a vacuum? It will attempt, in and of itself, to eliminate its vacuum, <laughs> to eliminate itself. There will be a natural force creating equilibrium to where that which is not contained within the vacuum will attempt to be pulled into the vacuum. It will attempt to create an equilibrium. And the vacuum is not a natural state. What do you want, and I know physicists have such a name, you know, so like when they talk about potential energy and stuff like that, what do you want to call the force that a vacuum represents that when it ceases to be sealed, because to get a vacuum, you must seal it. It's not natural. 
when it ceases to be sealed, it's going to have this effect on the environment around it. That force that is unleashed when the vacuum is unsealed is what desire is. Desire is not the emptiness. It is not the vacuum. Desire is not the objects that get reached for in order to pull into the emptiness or the vacuum. Desire is a physics force field that exists because of the lack of equilibrium between the vacuum and the non-vacuum, between the missing, the emptiness, the hollow, the lacking, and form. When they touch, or when they're allowed to relate to each other, what the relation will be is a giant an attempt to suck form things into what's missing. That, I don't know, we can't put it in words, but as yogis and yoginis, you should understand, that's what desire is. Very powerful force, isn't it? It's the force that would fill a vacuum. That's a very powerful force. (laughs) Okay? It's a physics force. It's not a psychological thing. It's not. There is lacking in the shakti. There is lacking in the chakras. There is lacking in the energy fields. When that lacking relates to whatever is around it, it attempts to create a force. A force. It does, nothing's attempting to do it. Nothing's attempting. The vacuum is not pulling the things into it. It's innocent. It's just a vacuum. It's just sitting there being a vacuum. The things don't want to go into the vacuum. They don't know anything about it. But you undo what's keeping them separate, and guess what's going to happen? That's what desire is. It's physics. It's really beautiful, isn't it? And you feel it that way. It's a powerful drive, isn't it? It's a powerful thing that causes that to be the relationship between objects and emptiness, objects and lacking. So that's what I'm going to call it, is that force field that attempts to equilibrate the lacking with form. What determines what will get pulled in? Now, this is different than with a vacuum. A vacuum, there is nothing but physics. Here, there is mind. What determines what will get pulled into that emptiness? Mind does. Mind does. That emptiness has no idea. I mean, absolutely no idea what it should pull in or would pull into itself. There has to be some other force field that is connecting the dots. And mind does that. So that when you feel loneliness, emptiness, you reach for something different than he does. And he reaches for something different than he does. Vacuums aren't like that, (laughs) okay? There's no discrimination of any way, shape, or form. Mind has had past experiences. So it's a learned bank. It's a programmed thing. When this lacking is attempting to pull into it, it passes through mind, which determines what has the highest probability based on past experiences or beliefs or hopes or dreams, whatever you want, based on mind what it is that's going to help to create the compensation for what's missing in there, to attempt to try to pull in and get a balance inside. So that's the dynamics. That's really what's going on, guys. I can't put it in Webster's Dictionary when they say desire. It's too big. But that is the process of desire. So it's very innate. It's very deep, very meaningful. How you go about trying to get it, eh, that's old stuff. That's, you know, who cares? The point is something is driving you to act. Something is urging you, pushing you, and pulling to cause this to happen. And, and you're not comfortable sitting inside without that no more than you can stay outside of a vacuum that pulls on you. It's a very unnatural thing to sit there and have that going on inside and do nothing, isn't it? <laughs> right? It's like it bothers you. It's, it's strong. That's all. It's strong. And it urges you and draws you and pulls you. You should not paint it as the devil. You should not paint it as evil. You should not paint it as wrong. You should paint it as physics. It's just physics. That's what's going on in there. So that's desire. But I said desire and fear. And you shouldn't talk about one without the other. These are the opposite poles of the magnet of the lower self, of lower creation. What is fear? That's very deep. That's very deep. The soul, the deepest root of fear, is the soul lost its sense of self. It is no longer sitting within its own seat 
It's no longer knowing itself as itself, reveling in its own experience of being. How does it lose itself? Where did it put it? No, it's not that kind of losing. What it did, and you have to understand, soul is a word. It really is just consciousness, awareness of being. Consciousness is so beautiful. They say it has no qualities. It has a nature, all right? Consciousness has one major, actually has a few aspects to its being. But one of the major ones is that it's able to focus its awareness on one thing, on many things, loosely or tightly. You know, it has this focus ability, doesn't it? All right? It's kind of neat. It's not changing consciousness. It's more like what you do with the consciousness, where, where you're putting it. If consciousness focuses itself, its sense of being, on things outside itself, for even just a little bit, you're going to see it doesn't take much. For even just a little bit too much and a little bit too long, it has projected its sense of self where it put itself. All I can tell you. Here it is, I know myself as myself. I'm looking at that object enough to where I'm not here anymore, I'm there. (laughs) The closest I always come to people is you're watching TV, you're sitting on a couch, you're in a room, there's people around you. That's where you are. That's who you are. You are this person sitting on the couch watching TV in the room with the people around you. And all of a sudden, something comes on TV that is the most fascinating, interesting thing to you that you've just been dying to hear about and see about. Within one second, you are no longer in that room. And there are no longer other people in that room. And you are no longer sitting on the couch and you don't have a body. You are sucked in to that TV completely. It is the only thing there is in your existence. There is nothing else. Are you sitting on the couch watching the TV? No. There is no awareness of that couch, is there? But I don't understand. Nothing changed. If I take a snapshot, it looks exactly the same as before when you were glancing at it. But now you're not glancing at it. Now you're watching it. You're focusing on it. When you project your consciousness sufficiently onto an object of consciousness, it leaves your seat. It leaves its center. And when it leaves enough, you're not there anymore. Not where? Not where you were. <laughs> you know, you're not aware. You shifted your awareness, so of course your awareness isn't where it was. Where's your awareness now? In the TV. Therefore, that's what you're aware of. And you're not aware of anything else. Should somebody shake you, then you're aware that you're on the couch and you have a body. But then you're not in the TV by the same amount, are you? That's the quality of consciousness that's fascinating, is the ability to project itself. It doesn't just project itself, it projects its sense of self. Look how easy the examples are. You do it all the time. All the time. So basically, that's how you get lost. That's all. When you project yourself away from yourself enough onto external object, external to yourself, then to be external out here, it could be mind, it could be emotions, anything. When you do that and you identify with your objects, your soul is lost. Very sad. Your soul has a deep sense of its being. And there's a sense of wholeness and a sense of completeness and a sense of God, a sense of its divinity without thinking. That's its natural, intuitive state. When it focuses on other than itself and sends too much of its awareness onto object and becomes object conscious, it's lost. And not only does it not know itself as on the couch, but it lost its family who was sitting around it. It lost its house. (laughs) That's what you lost because you watched that TV close, didn't you? You lost your children. You lost your spouse. You lost your house, you lost your job, you lost everything that meant so much to you. You don't know that you lost them because that would require being on the seat, watching and leaving. But something deep, deep, deep inside knows that something's wrong, that something is lacking, that something's wrong. It's got to get back something, all right? That is the root of fear. That is the root of all fear. 
I liken it most to an amnesiac. Should you get pupsed on the side of the head sufficiently to lose your memory, you won't be too happy about it. It's not like you'll sit there and say, well, I don't even know what I'm missing, so what difference does it make? Okay? That's not what happens. You know that that which you used to cling to, that which used to bring you a sense of stability and comfort, is not there. You don't know what it is, but you know it's not there. That you know. You don't know who you are. And I think if you will talk to therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists about amnesiac victims, they will tell you that fear isn't even the right word. The word is panic. There's a complete sense of panic of who am I? Who am I? How do I relate to the things around me? I lost my whole self-concept. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I belong to. I don't know who belongs to me. And it, it is not a comfortable thing. Can you imagine that? You know how scared you get if you can't find your keys. What happens if you walk out and your car isn't where you thought you put it? Imagine if you don't even know where your car is or where you live, whether you're married or not. Or What are you going to cling to? Do you understand that? That fear, that panic, that complete sense of lostness, when the soul projects its sense of self outside itself onto objects sufficiently to lose its sense of self, it has this intuitive knowing that it's lost. And that is a deep fear. It's uncomfortable. And it wants to take care of that. That force is different than the vacuum-creating desire. But you're going to see it's not so different. Just as the positive and negative ends of a magnet are totally different until you take it as a magnet. And what they create is one. They don't have separate magnets. They're just polarities. They're just qualities at extreme ends. They really make up a magnet, don't they? You will see before I'm done where the merger of desire and fear exists. But they seem so different. When you have a lacking, then it creates this vacuum that wants to pull things into it. Fine, that's what you experience as desire. When your soul does not know itself as itself, there is this deep intuitive sense of lost. And that lost creates what I will call the primal fear, the innate deep fear that is always there. And it's trying to take care of itself. How does fear take care of itself? Amazingly, what fear tries to do is hide and protect. How? By bringing things over itself. It tries to pull things to itself so that it doesn't have to be exposed, so it doesn't have to deal with itself. So it wants to involve itself in other things. It wants to bring things closer to itself. It wants to form alliances and allegiances of places of trust. It wants to do anything it can to create a place where it can live other than in itself. So fear tries to get away from itself. Fear is afraid of itself. I like that. Since fear's natural quality is fear, why would fear ever be comfortable with itself? It can't possibly be. So what does fear try to do if it's afraid of itself? It tries to get away from itself. And that's what you do with fear. If you will watch fear carefully, you will see you do not want to experience it. You do not want to stay there. So you try to go somewhere or get something or do something. So the what? Not to solve the fear. You don't even try to solve the fear. You just don't want to feel it. You don't want to experience it. You want to get away from it. Anything you can do to where you do not have to experience that thing. That is the tendency and the force that fear creates. Fear is interesting, almost like opposites. Fear creates an energy where you attempt to get away from it. All right? Desire, by its nature, is trying to pull things into it. But you're going to see in the end how similar these things are and how their roots are so much the same. You may even already see it. So net is fear and desire run your life. They run everything you do. You are either going out there because you see something you want to get to hold on to because there's a lacking inside of you and you want to pull this, or you see something out there that you want to stay away from or you want to get so that it helps you avoid your fear. If there's something outside that stimulates and pushes you back into your fear, you don't have nothing to do with it. I don't want to get anywhere near it. Get it away from me. Why? I am afraid of my fear. Or you see something outside that looks like if I can just hold on to that, Person, place, thing, finances, gun, (laughs) all right? Whatever it is, if I can just have that, it will keep me away from the fear. 
power, handsomeness, beauty, fancy car, anything I can do that will get me away from when I'm experiencing this fear. So these are the forces, one or the other polarities of that magnet that are driving your life. They are also the forces that create your psyche. Your psyche every bit, if you're deep enough, and you better be by now, to watch every single thing your mind says and be aware of every single thing that pours out through your heart, and you can just watch her. (laughs) You just watch her. It's a thing that you watch. When you watch, you will see here. Remember in high school physics, maybe even earlier, they would take a magnet and they put it under a piece of paper and they put metal filings on top of the paper and all of a sudden, they shake it off or blow it off and the filings, some filings stay. And then they taught you, this is the only way you can see a magnetic field. You can't actually see it, but you can see where it is now. That's what you're looking at, all right? So the magnet is not a magnetic field. The magnet is a magnet. But the magnet emanates, creates, results in a magnetic field of a particular shape depending upon the shape of the magnet, depending on the strength, shape, nature of the magnet. You are to think of desire and fear as the poles of the magnet. You are to think of the resulting field with its shape and qualities and nature as your personality, as your psyche, as your entire ego. It is the result of the polarities of desire and fear. It's what gets created, emanates out of this core of the underlying desire and fear. You build an entire personality, an entire psyche based on that. Well, let's watch that happen. Let's make believe there's emptiness inside. We'll start you off as enlightened. (laughs) Let's start you off as Buddhist, okay? So what we have inside is empty. Empty mind. Empty mind. What's empty mind? Mind with nothing in it. (laughs) Mind with no thoughts. Mind with no structure. Mind with no personality. Empty mind. Okay? Except it's not empty enough. Behind it is still core of this underlying forces of desire and fear. All right? In other words, it's not at balance. It's not at peace. It will not stay that way. So what happens now is you're feeling this pulling, this theme about desire, let's just say. You feel lacking inside, and it's trying to pull, right? So what happens is it has an experience. It meets somebody who's nice. She's nice. You meet her, she's nice to you. She's a hippie girl. She's nice to people. She's nice. She says something nice. That happens. And all of a sudden, what happens? It pulls that in and creates a moment of better. The emptiness feels better because this energy got pulled into it. Now, if that were a solution, that would be the end of my discussion. The problem is... When you bring that into yourself, how long does that feeling cessation last? Nothing. How do I know that? Because the very fact that you liked it, you want more. Right? It creates more desire. It creates more urge. It creates, you, want, you want to go visit her more. You want to start hanging out here. Is that what happens? Somebody does something that's nice. You want to find out where she lives. You want to get her phone number. You want to go shopping again where you met her. Right or wrong. Is that what people do? There you have it doing its thing. So this impression came in. And it not only came in and did some movement with the lacking, which didn't last one iota, but all of a sudden we don't have empty mind. She's in the mind now. Nice girl's in the mind. It's not empty anymore. So now all of a sudden when you're driving by Publix where you ran into her, mind is stimulated. Mind is activated. As is desire. Because it relates. Remember I told you, the mind is what relates the lacking. What to do about the lacking. Mind comes in, oh, go see her. Right, go hang out over there. Maybe it'll happen again. She'll be nice to you again. So we don't have empty mind anymore. And we start to build that. So not only do I have holding inside this event, which is now linked to my emptiness and created a desire and a need and a preference and so on, it literally becomes part of me. I'm the one who likes her. It becomes part of my self-concept. Who are you? I'm the one who likes her. <laughs> you understand? So now something else happens. Then something else happens. Then something else happens. I'm the one who likes this. I'm the one who doesn't like this. That's how it gets built, isn't it? So your whole model, your whole self-concept, your whole personality is held together by these magnetic fields of the desire. And I could do the same thing with the fear. If you have that fear and you're afraid of that fear and Mr. Tough Guy comes up and threatens you because you parked on the side of his road to change your tire or something, guess where you're not parking next time? 
<laughs> okay? You know, guess what? We no longer have empty mind. We now have, oh my God, it doesn't like him, and I don't go near him, or anyone who looks like him. Okay? I'm building it, aren't I? I'm building you. I'm building a you. <laughs> All right? Whichever you you want to build, that's how you build it, isn't it? And I end up, the Skinner, who remembers Skinner? Man is the sum of his learned experiences. Did you study that in psychology? Huh? Is that what you were taught? Man is the sum of his learned experiences. So we have that line. I love that line. That which I have described so far that went from empty mind to personality to psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. Girl showed up. Guy showed up. Think All of a sudden I'm developing an entire personality, an entire way of being, an entire action pattern. Likes, dislikes, actions. My actions are predictable now. Put her around, I like her. Put him around, I like another way. Just like the mice. Really, really neat. Yes, it is true that the psyche is the sum of the learned experiences. There's just one problem. You're out there studying it, Mr. Skinner, and seeing all this. I'm in here watching. <laughs> you can watch from outside. I can watch from inside. Who am I? Because I ain't the sum of my learned experiences. But I can watch the sum of my learned experiences just like you can watch the sum of my learned experiences. Okay. So man is not the sum of his learned experiences. The psyche is the sum of the learned experiences. So psyche is not empty mind. Now we understand empty mind. Psyche is not empty mind. What is holding that structure together? The same thing that is holding those metal filings on that piece of paper. Desire and fear. I showed you the causes of those. Behind desire and fear are the causes of desire and fear. We'll go back to those in a moment. Remember those. But they emanated and resulted in desire and fear, primal desire and fear, the very basis of it. Those forces are what hold your mind together. Those are what build your mind. Those are what determine what you're holding on to. And they determine how you will act. And they determine how you will react. And they determine every single thing that's going on there. The emanation of those forces hold the psyche, the force field of the psyche. Your whole aura is the magnetic emanation. Instead of using metal filings, we're using some scars. We're using impressions. The impressions are left within the mind, and those patterns are held together and organized, and which ones stay and which ones don't are determined by this magnetic field that emanates out as your aura. Really beautiful. It is all physics. Do you understand that? It's physics. It's magnetism. It's force fields. It's all that's going on. And then the self is watching and has projected itself into it, so it's lost. Don't think of it as your personality. You don't have a personality. You have an aura. And that aura, that energy field, acts different ways and reacts different ways based upon external stimuli that come in. And if you're not conscious, that's you. <laughs> right? That's how you're going to be. You're going to get weird around him and nice around her. And it could be opposite. All I got to do is change the little examples. All of a sudden, I'm mean around her and nice around him. Right or wrong. Okay? It's not you. It's not who you are. It's nothing. It's just physics. It's just an amazing process, just like the rest of creation, how it all comes into being, how this comes into being. is just force fields interacting with force fields, resulting in force fields and the poor soul. <laughs> it's just sitting in the middle of that and don't stand a chance, does it? <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. It has the power to free itself. But if it's not careful, it's going to be the sum of its learned experiences, isn't it? Or at least it's going to act like it. It's going to act like the sum of its learned experiences. So I started this discussion by telling you, if I only could know about two things in all of creation, right? desire and fear, with those two, you will come to know everything. They are the cause of why you're stuck and can't go to God. We'll get to that in a moment, what's behind them. And I said they were the cause of your psyche. They were the cause of your entire personality. Your entire lower self is the emanation of those forces. Now do you see that? The root of all of it is that. That's why you're yakking in there what you're yakking. That's why you got the emotions you got. That's why you got the urges, the impulses, the drives. Everything is emanating from those force fields. Therefore, that's why you act. That's why you do what you do and say what you say. And you know, Unless you're superhuman, that's what you're doing. You're going to be the result of your learned experiences. Or more appropriately, you're going to be the result of your desires and fears. You know, how you decided to put them together and decide to satisfy them and decide what to avoid. And you will behave that way. Because you will not want to get near your fear. You are scared to death of your fear. And your desire is pulling into it with a tremendous force of that vacuum. 
feel you have no control over that, right? It's very uncomfortable. And so you're going to do what it says. So these two forces, repelling, pulling, manipulating, hoo, 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 hoo. they say love makes the world go around. No, it does not. Desire and fear make the world go around, don't they? <laughs> okay, we can play all the games we want. Desire and fear make the world go around. That's why everybody's marching to the tune they're marching at, unless they're very highly evolved beings. All right. Now, I also said desire and fear are the cage, the prison, magnetic type, that trap the soul. I got it. It's the self. If you watch TV, if you get interested and you watch TV, you project your sense of self into it. Anything that draws your consciousness into it, you're going to get involved in it. This thing, this is powerful stuff. These force fields I'm just talking about, the self is overwhelmingly fascinated by them. You have this force field that's trying to pull things into it. It's active. It's dynamic. So imagine all that shakti and all that chi that's going on because of desires. Well, the self just watches that, and that's the end of it. That's it. It's over. Goodbye. You know, you got to be a great being to turn it off. It's very powerful. Fear is even worse. You know, I don't know which one's worse. I'm not going to talk about it, right? But fear is very strong stuff, isn't it? You don't want to experience that. That's all there is to it. You're scared to death of that. Well, then the soul is sucked into that. Isn't it funny how if you're scared to death of a snake, what do you do? Stare at it. Very interesting. <laughs> like, well, I want to know where it is. I don't want, I want, I don't want to get anywhere behind me. I don't want it behind me. Which would you rather have? Some of you are scared to death of behind you or in front of you? I asked you that once before, didn't I? No question, is it? I'm not even close. <laughs> right? I want it where I can see it. <laughs> so, all right? Well, the self is not going to take its eyes off of the fear. For the same reason you want it in front of you, not behind you. All right? And the self, unless it's very evolved, is not able to not be fascinated and drawn into the chi of desire, of that pull, of that force. In other words, it's going to satisfy something. It's going to take care of something. I'm going to be okay. These two are really strong. It's really beautiful. And it's really deep. So the consciousness is paying attention, to say the least, to that. Because it's paying attention to that, it can't leave. Because it can't leave, it gets sucked into the whole psyche. And the next thing you know, you're no longer the consciousness. You are this person that likes her and doesn't like him and is afraid to go over here but not afraid to go over there and has this hope and that dream. Just whatever you built to stay away from the fears and to take care of the desires becomes your whole personality and then it manifests externally. That's who you're with. That's what you wear. That's where you work. That's your house. And now you've got to hold on to all that because it's all part of you and you are gone. It's a fall from the garden. Like, boom, 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 boom. It's fall down the stairs. All right? And next thing you know, you're living out here and boy, are you lost. That's powerful stuff. Once you see this, and see it means you can just sit in there and watch. You just see it as clear as day. When you really see it, it's when you're no longer messing around with what's going on outside. You've already seen it. It's just Outside is just a result. Your whole relationship with the outside is just a result of what's going on inside. So who cares? No smart person deals with results. You deal with causes. You're not going to solve anything by dealing with results, are you? If you go there and deal with the result, you didn't solve the cause. What's the purpose of pushing around with the result? Your entire relationship with the outside is a result. I just showed it to you, didn't I? It is a result of what is going on inside of you. So when you get wise, that's not where you put in your attention at all. Not renunciation. I have to tell you that because it sounds like it's not. It's not even close to renunciation. Renunciation is push it away. It's nothing to do with pushing away. This is just, it is not a cause, therefore I'm not interested. I'm neither for it or against it. It's just a result. If I blow on something, it, it goes away. If I want it close to me, I'm not going to worry about the fact that it goes away when I blow it. I'm going to worry about why am I blowing on it. You can take care of that, it's over. That's why you don't mess with the outside. Not because it's wrong, not good, not bad, not right, not wrong, not better, not worse, not renounced, not nothing. It just is not a solution to a single thing under any circumstances ever. You seen that yet? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you seen that yet? It is not a solution to a single thing ever. Never will be, never has been, and that's that. Because it's a result. Temporarily, sure. We already talked about that, right? But just wait, you'll have to keep going. Whatever it is that you think is satisfying you, you know how you know it's satisfying? You don't have to do it again. <laughs> How's that? That's how you know it's satisfying. That's how you know it worked. You don't have to do it again. It's over. 
Oh, yeah. Goody, thank you. Right? We got married. Bye. It worked. I knew it would. I knew if you proposed to me and we could get married, it would totally fulfill me and I'd be happy for the rest of my life. Okay, goodbye. No, that's not what's going to happen and you're not going to be happy for the rest of your life. <laughs> Either way. You got it? Okay. So, net result is the outside is not a solution. It's a result. Once you see that it's a result and not a cause, why would you keep hitting your head up against the wall? And work. Okay, at some point you catch on. So now what? Now you look inside and what you see is mind. Mind and heart. Very noisy mind. Very active heart. So it seems as though what you need to do is fix that. But it's not. But no one will teach you that. It has nothing to do with mind and nothing to do with heart. And nothing to do with outside. It has to do with the polarities that are creating mind and creating heart. Mind is a result. Heart, you know what I mean by heart, emotional heart, is a result. They are not causes. They were causes of your outside behavior. <laughs> okay, that's why your behavior was a result, right? But then don't step in here and say it's a cause. A cause of what? It's not the cause, it's a result. Mind is doing what it's doing because there's something else in there. Heart is doing what it's doing because there's something else in there. Therefore, if you try to deal with it at the level of mind or heart, you will lose. And you know how rare that teaching is? Who will teach you that? That's all they teach you. Deal with mind, deal with heart. How mind is supposed to be, how heart is supposed to be, and what to do about it. No, it's much deeper than that. Mind and heart are created by what? Desire and fear. I went backwards for you. All right? They are the resultant emanation of the force fields of desire and fear. They are the aura that is emanated because of the polarities of negative and positive desire and fear. Therefore, you do not deal with mind, you do not deal with heart, pull back. And all of a sudden, you're dealing with desire and fear. But not what you're desirous about and not what you're afraid of. I'm talking about dealing with desire itself. The force field I just talked to you about and dealing with fear itself as a force field, not three steps out. How do you deal with the force field itself instead of dealing with the mind or the actions that they cause? It's actually very beautiful because it's really very simple. The force field of desire I already told you is this push, this pull, this vacuum filling, right? Can you sit there conscious while that is going on? Can you sit inside, relaxed, serene, at peace, meaning not reactive, while that force is emanating and expressing and doing its thing inside of you? When you know you're sitting at that level, you don't even know what it would choose. You're dealing with that force before it chose what you're desirous of. It's just a pulling force that wants to pull something into itself. You don't know what, and you don't care. You caught it before it went to mind and decided historically what it should be grabbing. You don't know if it's going to come up and say it should get married, if it should get divorced, if it should change clothes, or you don't know what it's going to say. <laughs> you don't have any idea what it's going to say. You just know it's going to say something. <laughs> if you let it go to mind, it's going to come up with some solution, isn't it? And that's when you know you got it. You just, it wouldn't matter what it picked. The point is, it's uncomfortable. There's this drive, there's this force, there's this vacuum that wants to go to mind, pick what it is it'll take care of, and then go out and try and get it. Can you feel that before it happens? You know you can. That is what it means to deal with the desire itself. It's dealing with the force field. Yogis deal with energy. Yogis do not deal with form. Yoga is energy. Yogis deal with prana, with shakti, always with energy. All right? This is the energy that is the emanation of desire. What do you do with it? You just sit there. <laughs> the consciousness sits there and doesn't do anything about it. And the same thing with fear. Fear is afraid of itself. It's a, it's a repulsive force. It doesn't want to be there. <laughs> okay, desire does. Desire wants to do something about it. Fear doesn't want to be there. Can you sit there while that is happening? While that force field is creating its disturbance. These are both disturbances, are they not? 
Okay, I'm talking about disturbances in the force. That attempt to pull things into it to be okay is a disturbance in the force. That attempt to get away, get away from it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. He's get away right now. That's a disturbance in the force. Those are disturbances in the force. All right? When the self can sit in those energies and just be there and see them for what they are. Poles of a magnet. Positive and negative, attractive and repulsive, and can just sit there. You're almost out. And guess what? In my humble opinion, you can't get out any other way. How can you? It's pulling you in. How can you get out when something's pulling you in? It's the wrong direction. If you cannot sit there comfortably when this thing of desire and this thing of fear is going on inside, what's your choice? Go to the next step to try to get rid of them. How do you get rid of this thing of desire? Satisfy it. And Baba once said something once. I loved it. No man has ever gotten rid of a desire by satisfying it. No person has ever gotten rid of a desire by satisfying it. Of course he's right. It's so far away from the cause. How could it possibly do anything? But it distracts you. It gets you away from that feeling that you can't deal with, doesn't it? Now I get to spread it out and deal with you and deal with her and deal with situations and deal with mine. Oh, that thinned it out a lot, didn't it? Right now I got 60 different things that I can spread it out, right? I don't want it to be focused like that. And by doing that, I can rationalize and play around and move it. Just dance a lot, can't I? I can spin. I would spin. Here, I'm terribly uncomfortable with this. Sorry, I'm not okay and so on. All right, well, watch this. If you get married... You'll be okay. Other people just watch the movies. It's wonderful. It's fine. Cary Grant and Dora's Day, all right? It's going to happen. This thing. If you get married, it'll be okay. Mine did that. Mine did that. How do you feel? Better? Better. Don't you? Right away. Mine steps in. If you get married, then that will take care of us. She'll love you and take care of you, and you won't feel this loneliness, and you won't have to have, okay, okay, it's getting better. And all of a sudden, the mind says, but I don't know anybody that I want. <laughs> Not even, I don't even have a potential list, all right? There's, I don't have any choices, okay? Guess what mine can say, right? But, yeah, but you never know when it's going to happen. It's one of those things that just suddenly somebody shows up, right? It's the most amazing thing. You may see her dancing across a crowded hall. It just could happen at any point. Or it could say, God, now that I know what it is, I'll bet I can attract it to myself. Right? It's like mind gets you out of it, doesn't it? You don't have to sit in that fire of the energy because you can go to mind and play. Did that solve anything? Since when did distraction ever solve anything? Of course not. All right? I'm having a terrible time. I'm going to a movie. I'm going shopping. Okay, just don't come out. <laughs> because when you come out, you're still going to be having a terrible time, aren't you? There's still an issue. There's still a problem. At some point, it will be re-stimulated. You did not deal with it. You distracted yourself from it. That's what we do. The choice is, if you can sit there, you don't have to go out there. You don't have to play that game. You don't have to get thrown out by the world. Can the soul sit there in these forces of desire and fear? And the answer is, of course Of course you It's not about the ability or the potential ability. It's about the intention. Do you really want to? It's the level of commitment. Because if you want to, you can. And that's true of everything. That's why it is said to you that the soul reigns supreme. The soul reigns supreme. There is no energy in this creation that is more powerful than the energy of your soul. Your will, which is, that is the energy of your soul, by the way. That intention, it's just how much will. It all goes back to the soul. Will comes from the soul. The moment you're going to see fear and desire come from the soul. (laughs) And then all the rest emanates out from there. It all comes from the soul. And the soul is supreme over all of it. Yukteswar said to Yogananda, I want to go to God. He said, I want to go to God. Yukteswar turned to him and said, the door is always open. Whenever you want to go, just go. Now, there will come a time where you will understand that that's the truth and always has been the truth. While you care more about staying away from fear and not having to deal with those impulses and forces of desire, don't you dare say you want to go to God. Because the answer is, you can't be sitting there watching every single thing about that TV and then say, where's my wife? 
She ain't in the TV. She's on the couch next to you. <laughs> All right? You've got to be willing to take your consciousness out of where you projected it if you intend to experience more. You can't do both. They're mutually exclusive. If you are totally fixated and completely uptight about the fear and about this impulse drive of desire, and you're unwilling to sit there, then you can't leave, can you? You have to get in to do what you can do. The minute you're trying to avoid those forces, you are on the other side of those forces from where you want to be. The soul sits behind them. There they are. The only way to get away from them for you is to go in front, to distract, to put your consciousness elsewhere. That's it. You're not going to put your consciousness back here. I once shared with you, in my, is just my view, when I was reading Genesis. Anytime I ever read Genesis, it blows my mind. The deeper I grow and the more I grow, and I don't read very often, but for Passover sometimes I look at it, and I sit there and look at that, and it just blows my mind about how, if you understand what they're talking about, it's just so obvious. So after you left the garden, we already talked about falling out of the garden, didn't we? That was quite a fall you took tonight. All right, straight out. Then you're left out here in the world to fend for yourself, aren't you? You're having to deal with all the objects because you're trying to use those to take care of your desires to, so you don't have to deal with the stuff. All to stay away from those two forces I just talked to you about. And then I read that I think years and years ago, and all of a sudden I, I never read it before, really, meaningfully. And I'm reading it, and then it said, at one point it said, and then God placed at the east gate of the garden a cherubim with a flaming sword that would keep man out in case he decided to go in and lest he taste of the tree of eternal life as he had tasted of the tree of knowledge. Then you start looking at what we're talking about. What stands between you and out? Those forces I just talked to you about. Fear and that force that's created by trying to fulfill, right? That, that energy force field, desire, the force of desire. You're not going to go there, are you? You don't want to go near that fear. You don't want to go near there. You stay on the other side of that to try and avoid those. There's your cherubim with a burning sword, right? It will keep you out of that garden, right? You will not go there. <laughs> you don't, and if you're out here, if you ain't walking through that, you ain't going nowhere, are you? Because your soul is on the other side of that. Now, it all sounds so weird, soul on the other side. No, you're on the couch watching TV. You're, you're on the other side of projecting your consciousness. You have projected your consciousness beyond the fear and desire to the form side so that you can get distracted and play and go out there and feel better. And those energies are driving you. When, you're, when your consciousness is over there, what's driving your energies? The wind that comes from desire and fear. They're creating that entire field. You always see that. So while your consciousness is on that side, you jumped over them on that side, you're not getting out. You have to be willing to remain conscious and centered and clear in the face of those two energies. And the moment you are calm and centered and clear in the face of those two energies, just go wherever you want. The whole thing changes. For one thing, the mind and the heart stop. They stop making all the noise. <coughs> Why? Because it is the projection of your consciousness onto them that is giving them the power to try. You know, you're the one who's trying to use them to get away from the desire and fear. You're out there trying to hide yourself by clinging to these things. The minute you stop doing that, it stops forming all that. There's no reason. It doesn't need it. And the mind just quiets down. You have stopped asking it to do the job you gave it, which is to help you avoid desire and fear. That's really what you're doing is avoiding those two forces. And if you cease to avoid those two forces, how? By ceasing to avoid the two forces. You just sit there, big deal. So what? At least you don't have to do all the rest. <laughs> I'd rather, I would rather sit there and get comfortable with those forces than be out here having to deal with every person and every place and everything to see if they're going to hit the thing and stir it up or not get what I need and worry about everything and be thinking all the time about how can I get it, how can I avoid it, which is what you're doing. We already showed that, right? And you just realize that's absurd. Just relax and release at the core, in the face of it. And the rest will go away. Over time, your mind will quiet down. Your heart will quiet down. And now when you sit there, it takes a while. When you sit there and you realize that desire and fear cannot bind you, you are free to leave. You're free to leave. You will start to drift back into the self. And all of a sudden, those forces of desire and fear that seem to be so overwhelmingly powerful will be at a distance. 
and they too will become crickets. They're just like crickets in the background. Where are you? You are in the self. You are in the self. You are sitting in the awareness of your being, watching what used to run your life at a real distance. So I wanted to deal with desire and fear. Now, I told you before it's done, you'll see that they're the same thing. They have the same root. The emptiness and the lacking that we said was behind the vacuum. That's what I said. Desire was caused by emptiness or lacking. I also said that when you projected your sense of self, outside of self, you felt lost. You got amnesia. That hollowness is the same root. It is the lost self that is creating the positive and the negative. That is the same lacking. It's the lack of self-knowledge is the true vacuum that is causing all lacking that is inside of you. The lacking of love, the lacking of complete lacking of this, self-conscious, whatever it is, all that sense of something's lacking is really because you're missing your whole being. And it is only when you come to know yourself as yourself that that goes away. And both go away simultaneously. Desire and fear go away together. They both are gone. They're gone. Because once you know yourself and you're comfortable knowing yourself, what exactly could you be afraid of? We already said the fear was because you had lost yourself. Now you have no loss of self. What exactly could you need? Nothing. There's no emptiness. Therefore, it creates no desire. So the root cause of both the positive and negative is ignorance, is lack of self-realization. That's why they say with the act and the moment of enlightenment, all samskaras, all karmic patterns fall away instantaneously. They're all burned in the fire of enlightenment. That is not poetry. Because the cause of all of it is gone, it all falls apart. If I turn off the magnet, all the filings are gone. I don't have to pull them off one at a time. (laughs) All right? That's it. It's gone. So this is a good thing to understand. At whatever level you can, what's the action item? Be comfortable with core fear and core desire. Before they have taken form, you will see them. Relax. Just relax and be comfortable with them. The self can be in the presence of anything. Who cares? It's just something you're watching. If you're comfortable with it, you don't have to try to avoid it. If you don't have to try to avoid it, you get to leave. Mm, Chakra